Hey everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we have Dr. Stan Tatkin, and we are talking about his book, Wired for Love. And we're going to determine whether you are an anchor, or a wave, or an island. <laughs> and, uh, and why that's important. Why is that important to your relationship style? And how knowing the whether you're an anchor, a wave, or an island can help you really um, appreciate and have a better um, relationship with your partner. So welcome, Stan. Thank you. <laughs> so first of all, I've gone through this whole shenanigans. Tell us what. what tell us about the the you know you talked about different kind of styles that um, a part or partner may bring to a relationship, uh, whether they be one of these three different styles. And those things as being the crux of understanding how you can create a really solidified, you define it as a, a couple bubble. Is that right? A couple bubble? Couple bubble, yes. Couple bubble. And that that's the critical thing for creating um, a beautiful partnership. But part of that is first understanding which of these three things you are. So can you help us understand, first of all, my a wave? Uh, are you a wave? <laughs> an anchor? Yes, what do you think I am? I have no idea, and I wouldn't dare to say. Okay. Uh, but no, these are these styles, uh, as you put it, are basically structural, and they're set really at very early ages in mm -hmm. childhood. They're flexible, they can change throughout life, you can certainly change, but they begin, so we all begin somewhere, and mm -hmm. we begin in early childhood. And so whether you're an anchor, an island, a wave speaks to the amount of security you felt with your earliest, most important relationships. And if nothing else has ha happened since that time to correct or change that, that, that relationship, um, you're more likely than not to be the same as you were when you were a child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was interesting because I would say that um, I will reveal to you that I am an island. And you are. I am an island. <laughs> and uh, proud of it. And proud of it, I guess. It's interesting because I'm, um, I, my background, I'm a, a Chinese American. So I have um, two different cultures combining at once. As a Chinese person, it's all about, you know, being by yourself, holding in your emotions. It's all about being an island, you know, and then as an American, you have this kind of, it's all about yourself, go for it, you know, you're an individual, it's all about competing. So I have it from both directions. And so I, I walk into the relationship as a solid island, um, which I think means, you know, it's about, as I understand my understanding about the island, it's like you're independent, you're fiercely independent, you're autonomous, you, you may strand your partner at a social function of which a guilty, guilty as charged, guilty as charged. Tell me your definition of an island since you wrote the book. Well, islands, you know, bless their hearts, um, come from a, a background where relationship was not the most important thing. Relationship mm -hmm. didn't come first. Mm -hmm. Usually performance of some kind or appearance mm -hmm. uh, came first. Self-esteem is very important. And as you said, independence is very important. Islands tend to be very sensitive to intrusion and interruption. Mm -hmm. They're accustomed to spending a lot of time alone. And because of that, they have a particular strategy of taking care of themselves, something we call auto-regulation. Mm -hmm. In other words, they tend to do better self-soothing and self-stimulating uh, because another person is just too complicated for that. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of moving away from people. Now, it's not to say that they don't love relationship and they don't need to be in a relationship. They do. Mm -hmm. They're just afraid that what a relationship might bring, if they're dependent on someone, they might lose their sense of self. They might lose their belongings. Mm -hmm. They might feel that they're being used. Mm -hmm. uh, they may feel trapped too yes. often. Yeah. And then want to get away. And this can be very confusing to the partner who takes yeah. it personally. And it's not. Yeah, and they may cry like that. They may cry like a, a cat. <laughs> yes, happy. that's our that's our cat, and she's a wave. Yeah, she's a wave. Okay, what's a wave? A wave uh, comes from a background where, again, relationships didn't come first, but there was a need somehow from the parents that the child had to take care of one or both of them emotionally. Oh. So there's a there's a reward for being dependent and being clingy, while at the same time, oh. 
there's inconsistencies in the availability of the parents. So there's a feeling of anger, resentment, even of feeling punished and abandoned by the experience of someone being there really intensely and then not being there. Mm. So the wave does a lot of push me, pull you. There's a lot of, you know, pull and then push away because of a fear of being rejected, of being abandoned. Mm. And they so often then abandon their partners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then don't all of us aspire to be anchors? <laughs> and I know you say no judgment, you know, because it's whatever you were raised with, you walk into the relationship with. And actually, I'm, I'm, I would say that my husband and I have anchor aspects to our relationship, but we walk sure. in with, as two islands. But tell us what an anchor is. Well, an anchor is someone who grew up in a family where relationship was the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And because the relationship is important, there's a lot of emphasis on repair. And, and attention to whether the relationship is in good order or not. Mm -hmm. The parents in an anchor relationship don't require the child on a regular basis to take care of their self-esteem or take care of them emotionally. In other words, these two parents have a good couple bubble in some manner, and they're able to take care of each other very well. They don't need to use the children for this. Oh, so, I, wow, that's interesting. Okay, got it. So the parents are self-contained units. They're not like, I need you to do well in school because I really need it for my self-esteem. That's, that's right. Okay, got it. Wow, okay. Unit yeah. that uh, where they're in each other's care, they take good care of each other, they protect each other. They, the kids do not have to worry about their parents. All is good in the land. And yeah. so anchor kids tend to be just more resilient. Mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not as afraid of things like losing the self or engulfment or abandonment. And mm -hmm. so they have a lot of resources to spend. They're easy to get along with. Yeah, yeah, interesting, because I would have thought that our children, the way that we've been raising them, because we have a pretty solid relationship, would be, be um, anchors. However, my youngest son, who's very emotional, feels more like a wave. So it's interesting, because there's personalities, right? Someone walks in with a certain type of personality. Like, my child likes to be very private. He doesn't want... He actually said, you know what? I, I, my, my school life is my school life, and my home life is my home life, and I want them to be separate. And I thought, well, does that mean he's an island, but he's also, like, very emotional? Does that mean he's a wave? Or how does this stuff correlate with his personality, right? That's very interesting, separation of church and state, separation of school and, and, and yeah. parents. Uh, so he sounds very smart. Okay, sorry? Sounds very smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, some of these things are personality. Is it all how you were raised, but could it also be your personality? Yes. There's two people in this equation, and so this is a relationship. That means that the, the outside relationship, the, the conditions have to be such, right? Mm -hmm. But there's also the child and their, their constitution and, uh, and their, their sensitivities and uh, their way of dealing with internal uh, experience. That also shapes whether somebody's an island anchor mm -hmm. or wave. Mm -hmm. so, but I think the take home here is that there's nothing wrong with being any of these things. There's nothing particularly you know, wonderful about being an anchor either. Um, that it doesn't really matter, um, but it does, it is important that people know what they are mm -hmm. and how they tend to act and react in close relationships so they mm -hmm. can take responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in the book, um, we were talking about your book, Wired <clears throat> for Love, you talk about all the different permutations, what happens when and you know, an anchor is with a wave, you know, and, and, and I actually really love the visual aspects of it because you can almost say, like, if an anchor is with a wave, you know, guess what happens? <laughs> I mean, you can kind of tell what would happen in that relationship. And then you talk about two anchors. And then mm -hmm. you talk about an anchor, you know, this island and what would happen. And so it, it, you really can tell by just thinking about the, the properties of those those three things, what would happen. Um, and it's, what also was, important. it's also important people know that, you know, there's uh, you can be uh, anchorish or islandish and or waveish, and that your partner, you know, that you push each other every now and then to being one or the other a little bit. So there's the personality or the character type that is really an island, uh, and then there are mostly people who are islandish. Yeah, I feel like I'm 
because when I read through here, I thought, well, I'm all three of these. You know, sometimes I feel like, oh, aren't you coming home? You know, like I have the kind of the wave who's like, aren't you? I feel abandoned or, you know, well, you left me at that party. You know, I, I definitely have those instances sure. where I feel yeah. wave like. And then there's sometimes when I feel anchorish and then sometimes where I feel islandish. You know, it's I can feel all three of those aspects. It's important to know which one you are, your primary type is walking in. Yeah, it, it's important to know and, and accept it and and not judge that. Right. But it's also important to know what you what you tend to do under stress, so that if you want to be in a secure functioning relationship, you know where both of you are operating as an anchor relationship, you have to take responsibility for some of your behaviors that are self protective but damaging to the relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. One of the things, um, if you actually look at um, research on, you know, number, a couple number, you know, top five reasons why people get divorced. Intimacy is one of the top things on there. You know, spending quality time, intimacy. But, and it's interesting because intimacy, it's like, what is that? W what exactly does it mean to be intimate? And when I read your book, it's this. It's all the things that I think. It's at least, I don't know. Do you view this as the same as intimacy or an aspect of intimacy? Well, I think your point is well taken. Intimacy is a word that anybody can use to mean any number of things. So uh, it depends on what it means to that person. But basically, if we're talking about secure functioning, intimacy means that you and I spend a decent amount of time face to face and eye to eye and even skin to skin mm -hmm. and that we are experts on each other. I mm -hmm. am as good at you as I am at anything else I do, mm -hmm. maybe better, mm -hmm. should be better. Mm -hmm. And you're, uh, you have my owner's manual, you're an expert on me, you know things about me, you know how to deal with me that other people just don't know. Mm -hmm. And this is how we get paid the big bucks as a couple is we invest right. in, in each other as burdens. Yeah. Take each other on as burdens, and right. um, and I have to know you um, uh, better than you know yourself in some ways, mm -hmm. perhaps, and mm -hmm. vice versa. Yeah, and doing so creates this cre uh, protective bubble. Tell us what the idea of a protective bubble is. Well, it is being in a foxhole together, so to speak. It's mm -hmm. where we understand that we have to live by certain principles that are good for both of us if we are to not just survive. In, a, in an environment, in a world that is generally hostile, mm -hmm. but also thrive and become the best people we can be. Mm -hmm. And so we do that by making agreements that nobody else makes with us, right? Agreements that uh, protect each other in public and private. Yes. We tell each other everything. Everything's transparent because we decide right. that's the best way to do business. Right. We're the first to know everything, not the second or third. We don't let third things or people or activities interfere with our resources, take resources away from us. We're very mm -hmm. protective of those resources. Mm -hmm. And so basically, we kind of get it that our purpose is to make sure that uh, all fears that we can take off the table are off the table, mm -hmm. such as will we exist tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That's gone. That's never even in question. Mm -hmm. And we we um, we take great pains to make sure that we are fans of one each other. That we know how to care for one each another. We know how to deal with distress quickly, mm -hmm. um, and you know, and dispatch it quickly. So, mm -hmm. so basically, the orbit that we that we travel around, our environment, our ecosystem, is one that we both create through agreement. And we stick to that because the alternative is not very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have this, when I'm visualizing, you know, in the movies where they have, you know, each person is back to back and they have a gun and they're kind of like, you know, like, <laughs> that's kind of what I imagine the protective. It's not, that's probably not a beautiful image. It, it could be like, you know, that's couples so embrace, but I, but it seems more like. They could, be they could be holding flowers instead of guns. Yeah. Oh, no, that's, that's far, that's too boring for me. <laughs> but Yes. Um, it, it is it is basically that people understand the biology of pair bonding, and that is yeah. part of the, one of the purposes of pair bonding is to protect each other from predators yeah. from the environment that's hostile. So. Yeah, that's why I think of the back to back, you know, holding your guns like this kind of thing versus kind of like you know holding flowers together. You know, I think that it's probably a little bit of both, right? Like when there's no one else around, you're holding flowers together, but you know, you're, you're a protective unit. So you work like you're in the army, right? Like, no, you know, no man goes down or what is it? No man left behind. 
no man left or woman left behind. Yeah. But also, you you know, uh, couples that have a good couple bubble are attracted to the outside world. People mm-hmm. want to be near them mm-hmm. because they represent something that we tend to value. Mm-hmm. We value coupling. Um, mm-hmm. We always have. It's in our DNA mm-hmm. as humans. So we love seeing good couples. We loathe being around bad couples. Mm-hmm. You don't want to be around them. Yeah, but good couples we're you know we're attracted to like moths to a flame. Yeah, yeah. So you, you actually said probably every single strategy in your book in probably one sentence. I did. <laughs> you did. You said one of the things for couples is to understand each other, and and one of the things I wanted to, and then you said there's understanding each other. You're saying. Uh, some of the ideas in your book is is always like you know connecting with each other, you know saying saying good night to each other, waking up with each other, those kind of physical connections, a whole skin to skin, you know, attached feeling that you have with your partner when you're at a party, not necessarily abandoning them or coming up with a couple of rules like if you see me go, that means come and help me because I don't want to be with your brother-in-law or you know if you see me go like this that means like save me or get me the hell out of here you know it's like those kind of contracts that you're talking about but there's a whole bunch of ideas that I want to talk about later but I wanted to um first go to um talk about uh one of the questions one of the things that um I think is really valuable in creating your user manual I think you talk about your owner's manual you know, I have my owner's manual. My husband has his owner's manual. I just want to know, like, how do I turn the lights on when it's foggy? You know? <laughs> or, Wait, do, do you have his and he has yours or you just have your own? Uh, I think I probably, I basically have neither. What I, re- I realized from your book is I don't have either. I don't have his owner's manual, nor do I have my owner's manual. And I thought it would be interesting if you can kind of step me through, because in um, one of the exercises is how are you vulnerable? And that's really a hard one to do on your own. So right. I was wondering if you can step me through as if I'm a client. And I'm a, I'll am be a good client. I'll get through these things fast because I have a lot of self-awareness. But help us kind of... And I would I encourage you, audience who's listening, to kind of, could you do that with us? Is that a possibility to step through that? Well, step through that exercise. And yeah, through, yeah. That, you'll have to remind me what that exercise is. It's okay. been a while since I've written that book. All right. <laughs> you wrote this exercise, How Are You Vulnerable? So you said you want to sit down and have your take some private time and think about the issues that have deeply affected you from as early as you can remember all the way to the point in time. What things still dog you today? So Wait, this... here's, here's, the, here's the gist of that, yeah. that exercise. Do I know your kryptonite? Do mm-hmm. I know what, from childhood, the things that, the two or three things that would knock you for a loop, no matter what, it will be that way probably until the day you die. These yes. are your areas of vulnerability. Do I know those? Right. And if I know them, then also do I know what to do if I see you triggered? either from me or from the outside. Um, th- this makes me valuable because now I know how to care for you. Other people don't know these things. I do. I also know how to protect you from those things if I see them in the environment. Um, but I also don't have to ask you every time what's wrong. What's saying what's wrong to you is a little bit like saying, who are you again? Yeah. And this way I know. I can guess. I know you. I know the things that affect you. I know the things that make you tumble and make mm. you anxious and make you depressed, deflated, and I know what to do. Uh-huh. That makes me very valuable. Right? Okay, um, so I'm going to take one one that's me and then one that's my husband so I can kind of see how this plays because I think this is one of the most critical things in here. So one of my, um, as a, a, a victim of a tiger mom, I would say, uh, you know, it's kind of like, it's all about your performance. It's all about how well you do. It's all about all those things, right? Which is like, I'm turning you into an island as a result, you know, but, but those are the things that I learned as a kid. And so whenever someone is critical or whenever I feel like my, I'm actually being measured on an achievement and what did I do today? Those are kind of my like kind of tender, vulnerable places. Yes. So, and interestingly enough, those are my husband's as well. So it's kind of a, the interesting thing is we have the same set of instructions for both of us. But if you heard this kind of person, right, what would that, what would you, you know, as a doctor of psychology, what would kind of go in the back of your head would be like, okay, this is what I need to do. Oil every two weeks. Like what's, what's your owner's manual when you hear like a 
something like well, that? For, let's say for your partner, both you share the same vulnerability. Mm-hmm. It's important to not use that against each other so mm-hmm. that you are aware, both of you, that you can be critical, that you can look for you know, fault, uh, ex, you know, expect perfection, that you can be harsh at times and that mm-hmm. you don't want to turn that on each other. Mm. Um, and if you do, because the, the likelihood is high, right, we just do what we know, that you can see the results of this. In other words, I'm your partner and I become critical and I see the results. You start to feel shame. You start to feel angry with mm-hmm. me. Then I can repair that. I can mm-hmm. say, you know, sweetheart, I'm sorry. I, that, I was, that was wrong. I was being very critical. And you know how it mm-hmm. means for me to do that. Um, and so we can... You know, we can reparent ourselves by knowing the, you know, by not using the things that were hurtful uh, on each other uh, because we're birds of a feather. Mm. We, we can uh, fall um, with the same sword. So, uh. so it's, it's about sensitivity. I mean, when we talk about secure functioning, we're talking about three major areas here. Mm-hmm. Secure functioning relationships are mostly just, fair, and sensitive. So here we're in the area of sensitivity. Are the two of you sensitive to each other's injuries? And mm-hmm. you, you know that you can use these swords or these weapons on other people, but just not in each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So when I think of this, um, it says the second step is you may recall specific incidents. For example, this could be an argument your partner had in which you became angry or a time you felt depressed, lonely, or rejected. And so the, I just had a kind of click, click in my head is that we often talk about how much did you do for the family? I yeah. actually drove the kids and I did this and I did the laundry and you did this and I did the garbage, you know, all this stuff, right? Bean, bean counting. Yeah. So if you, if you mirror that, that kind of, I actually am so exhausted because I've been driving along all day. You know, my husband is like, are you telling I didn't achieve anything today? So it's, it's kind of, um, knowing that he has that sensitivity i also have that sensitivity so even talking about it in a different way because that was in the very beginning of our marriage probably every single argument was about who being counting who did yeah. what for the family yeah. yeah so that's interesting so if i if i were sensitive i'd say i'm i'm not i'm not talking about you or what you accomplished but i'm feeling bad because i didn't you have to understand that that islands um, are very sensitive to attack <laughs> and that's because that's because they've been there. They've yeah. done that. So forgive an island if he or she uh, assumes that whatever is coming is going to be hurt. Um, and so you just have to be aware of that. That mm-hmm. that, that was a tactic that was used by parents to mm-hmm. troll kids. Right? We're mm-hmm. we're all product of our, our adaptations to our environment. Mm-hmm. So it's you know it's, it's not good or bad, but it is irritating. Right? So. Um, as long as the two of you are respectful of this. But also, here's another thing. You are only as good as I say you are, and I'm only as good as you say I am. Mm -hmm. And so to not be a fan of yours, to not um, support you and build you up, means you will not perform well for me. So from an honor perspective, it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. You perform better when I believe in you, Mm -hmm. not when when I doubt you. Right. So there's another reason to not do that. To be very yeah, clear. yeah, it's interesting because it's it seems counter, right? Because if it you're an island, counter. you figure whatever. I don't need you. I'm fine however I am. But it does help if you're if you're surrounded by another island that's friendly versus a, fr- a war a, a warring island that's shooting darts on you. Even though it can you know barely reach you, it's still not it doesn't make you comfortable. Right. Well, you bring up actually a point. Uh, this is what Love and War, the first book, was about is our brains are built much more for war than for love. Mm-hmm. And so people have to be, even in love relationships, especially in love relationships, very uh, very aware that we're animals and that we're animals that become extremely sensitive to anything that's dangerous or threatening, mm-hmm. even um, even a look on the face or a tone of the voice, mm-hmm. and that we have to be respectful and cautious and, uh, uh, and understand that we're uh, much... Uh, more likely to take a negative experience than a positive experience. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's one of the most fascinating um, sections in your book about the brain. 
Um, just to wrap this up, because and then I want to loop back to the brink stuff, because I think it's fascinating. So, like, in the instances, you know, to actually help, help your um, spouse figure out your own owner man owner's manual and of the different exercises I could figure out how to do all of them except this one I was like I'm not sure what this means but I'm hearing what are you vulnerable about so mine may be both of us may be achievement and then how you may recall a specific incident like we're arguing with each other about you know how much we achieve for the family and then jot down all yes. the incidents and issues that come to mind and when you're completed go back and look for commonalities and then focus on your vulnerabilities, and then and then the next step after that is what can you up what what can uplift your partner? So then you actually figure out okay what would if if what would be the good thing that I could say to what could, what could my husband? Is that what this is? It says you may yeah. find. What's the antidote to your feeling that you have to be perfect? It's my telling you that you're perfect. Uh, you're perfect as you are. You're great. Yeah. Um, I love what you do. Yeah. I, I'm an admirer of what you do. Yeah. I'm proud of what you do. I right. think you're the best at it. Yeah. And so, you know, for some people, uh, for some people, you know, uh, hearing that they're handsome or they're pretty means nothing. Um, they need to hear that they're smart. And this is something for partners to figure out. Mm. In, other words, in other words, what makes you feel moved? Um, well, for me, it's to give you uh, flowers, but that's not for you. Um, mm -hmm. I have to learn what makes you feel moved, what's meaningful to you. What would be the important thing for me? Yes, what you? works for you. Right, right. Or maybe I want to feel perfect, or maybe I want to feel intelligent, but you just give it to that person yes. um, on an ongoing basis or on... Uh, whenever needed. As needed basis. Whenever needed. Yeah. Um, you know, we step up to the plate and we stay to do exactly what our partner needs in that moment. Yeah. And and tell us about the brain and why all of this is important. I mean, I understand you talked a little bit about the warring part. And I assume that's like, you know, that you have this amygdala, which you call your primitives, that are running the show half of the time. It's amygdalas are right around here. It's right here? <laughs> right around here inside, yeah. Oh, right here. Inside, yeah. Right around inside there, yeah. Okay. So we have our amygdala... Um, we have, you know, different parts of our brain that are operating. So we talked about the fear part. Um, tell us a little bit about how you use that information to come up with your book, Wired for Love. Well, I, you know, we have these areas of the brain that are old. They're very fast. Um, they're uh, efficient to run, cheap, inexpensive, but they're based in memory completely. Mm -hmm. That means that they don't change very fast, very much. We call those the primitives. Mm -hmm. And this is really what's running your life 99% of your day mm -hmm. is run by your primitives, which mm -hmm. is to say an automatic brain. This mm -hmm. is a brain that's fully automatic. Mm -hmm. And then you have the upper fancy parts of the brain, the ambassadors. These provide a lot of fancy calculations, dealing with novelty, figuring things out, uh, being able to um, project into the future, but a real big function is that they regulate the primitives. Mm -hmm. They help calm the primitives down mm -hmm. when we feel threatened. Mm -hmm. So, um, so our ability to opt, act and react automatically is, uh, well, I'd say it's it's a hundred percent. That's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, real time is extremely fast, and so basically, you and I are operating through an automated form of of you know memory, procedural memory, anticipating what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we're going to make a lot of mistakes mm -hmm. because we think we know each other. Mm -hmm. um, the antidote to that is paying very, very close attention. And that mm -hmm. uses our ambassadors. So mm -hmm. the more I use my eyes to look at detail, to notice your face, to know what you're doing, to notice your body, your voice, to really pay attention very closely not only the better I am with relationship, but the more likely I'll fall back in love with you because love is something, a system that is cultivated uh, in close-up, mm -hmm. eye-to-eye, face-to-face. Mm -hmm. So we want people to understand how we're animals mm -hmm. and that we're not as smart as we think we are, yeah. that, we're, uh, that we're running on automation, on memory, and most of the things we do, we don't know why we're doing them. Right. And we and we make it up as we go. Yeah. That's that's how we work. Yeah. Um, 
I love one of the exercises in here and when um, to further on that when you have that you have your partner be like well this is what I'm look like when I'm angry yeah or this looks like what I look like when I'm sad you know so so that they know how like this is the CJ animal and this is what the CJ animal looks like when she's sad. Right. And that's very obvious. But do I know the beginnings of sadness in you? Yeah. Do I know exactly when you're fighting sadness? Do I know, um, do I know basically, can I guess what's going on inside of you because I'm able to read you well? That's mm. because I've spent years studying you. Mm. Yeah. So that's going back to your earlier point of really, really almost understanding your partner even better than how they understand themselves and it's probably easier for another person to understand someone else because they can observe whereas half the time you have these primitives running around doing stuff so, and that you're not even even conscious of that's happening that's right. so, that's right. so i learn a, i learn a great deal of myself through you yeah. yeah all right so there's a whole bunch of different things that you have in here where it's from um some of the basic things that we've talked about already which is knowing your partner really well and then there are things like sleeping and waking together there's you know a whole bunch of guiding principles um and i wanted to go back to those you mentioned them earlier so there's uh sleeping and, and being together saying hello and goodbye it's all about launching and um launchings and landings and and yeah. basically reunions yeah and that were um uh, whether you, it doesn't matter who you are on the, that spectrum we were talking about anchors islands or waves we are all very sensitive to abandonment yeah. and two most vulnerable times in children, adults, in our day cycle is nighttime before we go to sleep and when we wake up in the morning. Mm. So we want people to take those times seriously that we still need to be put to bed at night as adults and we need to be woken up together so that we are now moving through the day sort of fully charged, mm -hmm. you know. And this is, you know, I say this to couples who don't have very much time during the day. If you have very little time, you really should be building in uh, bedtime rituals and morning rituals that help you feel energized mm -hmm. and safe. Mm -hmm. Safe, tethered at night to, to go to sleep. You know, these are very scary times. We forget that going to sleep is like death. Mm -hmm. We're losing consciousness. We're very alone. Mm -hmm. And then we wake up very alone. Mm -hmm. um, and so these affect our sleep and affects also our daytime performance. Mm. Mm. And so I ask that people do something, anything, um, to close the night together and to open the day in the morning together and see what that's like as a science experiment. Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting because my first reaction was like, and you mentioned this in the book, is, you know, people have different, some may be a night owl, some may be an early bird. And you talk about a couple of instances where couples change. Like if you are a night owl, you literally force yourself to change your rhythm so that you can be with your partner and, yes. and that that helps a lot. And what do you see as a difference when you've seen couples do? Cause, cause I'm, I'm, I'm all about sleep. So when I hear that, like, what you want me to change the way I sleep? Like, I, I don't know if I love you that much, but I mean, what ha what's happened? What happens when you see that happening? When couples well, do change? Yeah. Yeah, there, there's, I mean, even if you are a night owl and your partner is an early bird, mm -hmm. um, you can still put each other to bed at night. And then if you're a night owl, you just go up and stay up a little bit if you want. Yeah. But I do worry a little bit about um, island night owls because yeah. um, they think they're good at taking care of themselves and they're actually not very good. Mm -hmm. And so it's not uncommon for the island uh, night owl who's by themselves to... Mm -hmm. You know, maybe eat a little too much, maybe stay up a little too late, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, uh, you know, not take as good a care of themselves. So mm -hmm. it's still better, I think, to go to sleep at the same time if possible. Yeah. And it's uh, it's generally easier for a night owl to make the adjustment than an early bird. In other yeah. words, their clocks are set a little strongly, more strongly. Mm, interesting. Okay, but what are the benefits? I do that, and I know that I'm... I'm showing to you I'm here. I'm not abandoning you. You've just gone. You just had death happen when you went to sleep and you wake up and I'm still here. You know, I was here when you died. I'm here when you're alive. What happens as a result of that? Well, there are lots, a lot of studies about co-sleeping and that, that we regulate each other's autonomic nervous systems at night yeah. when we co-sleep. So our sleep tends to be a little better. Mm -hmm. But also um, our, our morning and our launching tends to be better too. If you've ever woken up 
um, and your partner isn't there in, uh, next to you, then you know what I'm talking about. There's yeah. a bit of a jarring yeah. effect. Kind of like, because, what happened? Yeah, you feel unexpected. That's right. But the same thing happens if people pay attention when their partner, when your partner goes to sleep before you, pay attention to what that's like, even though you may like it because now you're free, mm -hmm. but see what that's like because there is a feeling that somebody has just left. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so uh, you know, it, people can make of this what they will and do what they can. Yeah. But the principle here is putting each other to bed at night um, just as you needed that when you were a child. Right. I think we still need that. Yeah. I think the other one that I really like is um, this kind of, they to me, they seem coupled together, kind of your go-to people. Who do you talk to and share your deepest, you know, secrets with? And then um, the last chapter, I think, very close to the last is the whole idea of a third. You know, if you have a third party, party that you're someone who you're really intimate, maybe like, oh, my closest girlfriend, you know, those kinds of things can feel very threatening to a relationship, which I think happens a lot in relationships. Can you talk a little bit about what those, Thirds, those ideas yeah. mean? Yeah. So thirds are something that exists no matter what. There's mm -hmm. always thirds. Third mm -hmm. is a competing, um, either it's a task or it's a person or a person's um, or perhaps it's a preoccupation uh, or, a kid, even. Alcohol, yeah. or a kid, but any third thing that, that competes with the couple's resources, that is always going to exist and always going to try to impinge on the couple. Mm -hmm. But the couple has to decide um, when and how these third things um, are allowed in. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's best done with each other's permission. And the reason for that is mm -hmm. that you and I, as primary attachment partners have an expectation that we are primary. Mm -hmm. And when suddenly we're relegated to secondary or to a third, we don't like it much. Mm -hmm. I am thrown under the bus by something, or you did, or I am relegated to second fiddle or third wheel, or I'm demoted somehow. Mm -hmm. You're, it's going to cause big trouble in the relationship, mm -hmm. in the couple bubble. So mm -hmm. people have to pay attention to these third things, whether it's work or, um, or a kid or a mother-in-law or an ex-spouse or anybody who's a threat to the couple system. Mm -hmm. um, if, if either of us ruin that system, uh, then we're, we both suffer, you see. Mm. So how do you deal with that when it's a, a sense of a friend, like you have a really close work associate or a dear friend that you've been friends with forever, you know, and then they yep. come in town and, and it's almost like you're relegated to nothing, you know, when that happens. Yep. So is it just having a conversation like that made me feel bad or what, what is it the conversation that you need to have so that you are back to your couple bubble scenario? Well, that's without repair, but hopefully people have agreements before this. So uh -huh. you and I, um, you and I uh, agree about how we handle third things. Right. And so if there's a contest between that third person or thing and you, someone has got it's to lose. Right. Um, and it can't be you very much, otherwise I'll pay for that. So if my mother wants, it keeps intruding in such a way that puts, where I feel like, oh, I'm between you and her for some reason, I'm really not. Right. Um, there's always a choice, and the choice is in this bid for resources, attention, who is going to lose? Somebody has to lose, mm -hmm. and it ought not to be you, my partner. Uh, uh, and if it is you, I've got a lot of apologizing and making up to do. Yeah, or in, in the instance that you have in some, uh, or uh, making you win in some other way. It's not a lose-lose. So if, yes, I'm going to be spending time with my mother, I know that's really painful for always you. A win, always a win-win, but here's what I'm going to do. Yeah. I'm going to stick by you. It's going to be us. She's you know, going to be on the outside, not on the inside. Whatever you want, we'll make it short. And then right after that, I'm going to take you to your favorite, most favorite place. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And then the last you use as an example that I've seen before in couples where, you know, they, they, um, they have a, they have the third, the third is their child, their children. And then also yes. their children leave to school and the couple looks at each other like, who are you? What, what's happened? <laughs> like, who are you? So what, I, I, I must have missed something. Uh, when, when, uh, when you have an empty nester and the couple is actually uh, yes, spent yes, yes. all their energy raising these kids, 
Then the kids go off to college and the couple looks at each other like, now who are you? You you were my planning partner and my driver, but who are you? Um, this was a mistake. This was a mistake that was made um, long ago. Yeah. And, um, and the chickens have come home to roost in that, in that sense. Because you and I should have remained a couple and we should have remained girlfriend and boyfriend also during this time. Yeah. And we are raising children as a couple's exercise. Our children come to our party. Right. Um, and so what happens is uh, that wasn't the setup. That's not how we maintain the relationship. Right. And so now we're back to each other and we don't know what to do because we weren't together this whole time. Yeah. Is it, what do couples, I see that as very, very common oftentimes that, you know, parents are just so focused on their kids and then all of a sudden they leave and they're like, Whoa. so how does one rebuild? Um, if, you know, they've set up this dynamic that they may, that they've had for 18, you know, 25 years, what do they do? Well, first, first not blame each other because they're both at fault. Um, mm -hmm. so they're both, you know, they're both at fault. They both did this, yeah. they both created the situation. And so. Uh, so bad on both of them for that sense. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, what they should have done to begin with, and that is to, uh, to create a system where they come first, the relationship comes first, uh, and that was not the case, obviously, mm -hmm. before then. Mm -hmm. So better late than ever. But, um, but again, if people are, are, you know, have kids now rather than wait for that time to come, right. now's, now's the time. To start to uh, to uh, create a stronger couple system, because the kids need to see their parents in love mm. and and good managers of each other. The kids do not need individual relationships that are terrific. Mm -hmm. They need to see their parents um, in a uh, mutually supportive relationship, because mm -hmm. that's what they're going to model after. And mm -hmm. that also is what makes them feel secure: mm -hmm. is that mom and dad are all right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So it is, uh, it seems like it's redeemable. I mean, it's possible. It's possible to pull, because what I've seen most couples do is they just say like, okay, we're two islands. That's, you know, we're done. We're just going to live as two separate, we've lived as islands, we're going to continue as islands, and they just kind of live as two separate islands, which I think islands can do, except for, because they fool themselves that this is okay not to have anything. But what, is that Different a fallacy? Home. Is that a fallacy? Is that a problem? I mean, I see a lot of couples choosing to do that. Well, it's not a fallacy, but the, the proof is in the pudding. Are they happy? Mm -hmm. Chances are they're not. Yeah, they're not. And so that's the million-dollar question. Are you happy? Yeah. Um, you know, people could do whatever they want, but, you know, as a couple therapist, I, I provide futures for people. I want to make sure they have a future and that the future is not just simply serviceable. Right. But that it's, it's great. Right. Um, because you get only one life, so why do it? Why do it any other way? And a lot of people don't know this, and they settle, and then they, uh, and then they, you know, they give coupling a bad name um, to their kids and to people around them because mm -hmm. they just never knew how to do it, mm -hmm. and they never saw it done well mm -hmm. either, so they mm -hmm. didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really a question of, you know, um, is this uh, is this mutually beneficial? Because really. I think two people have to ask the question, why are we together? Why do we exist as a couple? What's yeah. the purpose? What's yeah. the point? Right. Why, not, why not hire someone to do these things? What right. do we need each other for? I'm yeah. serious. No, it's true. Yeah, you're right. And, yeah. and we can almost predict the success and failure of relationships by how people answer this question. Mm -hmm. um, people who don't know, they don't, well, they say, well, you know, because we like each other, or we used to be in love, or... Mm -hmm. um, we have a kid you know, together. We have, we have kids, or we've spent all this time together. This is not sufficient. Mm -hmm. uh, there has to be a greater purpose. Mm -hmm. Like we do things for each other that nobody else wants to do. Mm -hmm. um, we're, you know, things that, that make the relationship um, a reason to be. And I think this is in itself an intervention that couples can ask themselves. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the point of us? What right. do we serve? What do we serve? Mm -hmm. Um, that question is an important question to answer, not because it's, you know, you know uh, the answer is going to be necessarily a good one, because it probably won't be, mm -hmm. but it's to put people on notice that this is, um, th th these questions have to be answered in order to have a good relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I actually think, I don't know, when I was thinking about that particular scenario that I've seen is very common, and is very common because it's so easy to do, is yeah. that... This seems to be the solution to that, right? I mean, at least a start, 
if not the whole yes. solution. I, I, when I look at it, it, th- it seems like, well, you've, you're two islands. Even if you've been that way for 18, 24 years or whatever, you can actually still rebuild and, you know, it, and get back to a place where you're, you know, the couple bubble versus two islands. I, I, I don't know. Is that simplifying or could, if you're in that state, could, is this a secure? Good yeah, a secure functioning relationship by itself, regardless of who you are, means that you're in a relationship that is mutually supportive, where you're committed to creating win-win situations between the two of you, where you have each other's back, where you're totally in service to each other in a relationship. This, you know, regardless of who you are, people in secure functioning relationships are not unhappy. Mm-hmm. They're happy. Mm-hmm. Happiness comes from a sense of safety and security. Mm-hmm. Um, and trust, mm-hmm. um, and there's a there's an aspect of duty to it, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, it doesn't matter. This is what we say: secure functioning relationships could be had by anybody. It doesn't matter mm-hmm. where they come from or what their character is like. You just have to want to do this. Mm-hmm. You have to understand that life gets more difficult and scary as we get older. And what do we have for that? Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. well, we have the union of two people who are going to care for each other in a world that really doesn't care mm-hmm. um, when it comes down to it. Mm-hmm. But you and I have each other. We're loyal to each other. We're there for each other. We're each other's friends. We're each other's go-to people. It's not, it doesn't mean we don't have other people in our lives. Right. But we're at the top of the food chain. Make yes. no mistake about that. Yeah. Make yeah. no mistake about yeah. that. Yeah. I love it. You know, and, and what's so interesting, I've read um, in February, I was doing a ton of interviews with uh, people who are in your line of work and couples therapists. And yeah. um, and I would say the vast majority of books, I'm like, yeah, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm doing that. And this book, I thought, you know what, I'm doing it, but I can do even better. You know, there's it, there's some nuances and things in here. I'm like, yeah, I, I'm doing it. I mean, if people were to look at my husband and I, they'd say, wow, you're like, we're the couple that people go to dinner and they're like, oh, it's just like people are looking at us and we're like, it feels uncomfortable almost because we don't know why they're looking at us. But I mean, they're attracted to you guys. Yeah, because I think it's the thing that you're saying. They see that we're in love. You know, we've been with each other for, you know, almost 20 years and we're still in love with each other. I mean, it gets better and better. And I can look at this book and say, and it can even get better, you know. <laughs> There are areas, there's always areas to that I, I think you can improve. So this was really nice because I could look at here and go, oh, there's still, there's still more for us to do. And it's exciting that there is even room for the joy that we have to even get better. You know, it's, it sounds crazy, but yes, that's the way that I read your book. Yeah, why not? Thank you so much. It's a really lovely book. I think you brought a whole bunch of, um, this is a unique book. I, I haven't read, and I've read a lot of books lately. <laughs> it's very, very unique, and I think um, really one of the most profound ways that we can build intimacy, which is so, so important, because if we're not going to be intimate with our partner, if we're not going to be in a happy relationship, then what are we doing? I mean, I think that's the question you asked, and I think it's completely right on. Might as well get a Rottweiler and have it bite you. <laughs> All right, so we've been talking to Dr. Stan Katkin, Wired for Love. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'll cut it right there. There are a couple times where you faded in and out. So As did you, yes. Those. Yeah, and, and cut out. I don't know what happened. I don't know if my husband's upstairs listening to something or other or what, but we'll see. Thank you so much. It's really interesting. Electronics, what can you say? I know, I know. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay, good welcome luck, back. Good luck with you. And great lighting. You did a great job. Thank you. That's yeah. lovely. And I'm so smart. And, you are very smart. And beautiful. You are gorgeous. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Dan. Take care. Bye. Bye. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.